furniture. I was still going to the back of the So, yeah, they rented a big building. So, that's what happened. So, he really has nowhere to put us up in these. So, that's what I was thinking. We have to stop somewhere. So, I thought, well, we'll just go not far and stop near Fontaine. I just come to you maybe before the edition. I will email you anyway. Yeah, I'm going to be near your town. Now, what's the name of your town? I'm going to be near the Fontaine building. So we will begin. And keep the door open, hopefully, if you want to pull out. Um, just in case you're on the right, make sure you're on the right train. <laughs> that this is a part of the Slow West Learning Series about money, uh, managing your money more skillfully, but also in a more green way, in a more ethical way. Um, and so many of us at Slow West have said we're really in the dark about money, and especially about how to save and invest money in a way that actually helps the environment and is ethical. It's kind of hard to find the answer to that question. So, uh, so, to not, so my name is Joyce Hardman. I'm uh, representing Slow West. And we're the gang that put the whole series together for you guys. Uh, also, Bill Shields is here with Slow West and Kathleen Shields. And then Adam Frey is over here videotaping, I think. Is it going to be video? Yep. So we want to also check. Is that okay for all of you to be? Usually he'll be mostly focusing on Rita, I think. You Can you get my good question? side, Adam? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so if you need a makeup job. <laughs> there you go. I can do extensive editing. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yes, can you take a wee line? <laughs> So just before we start, you know our names now. I'm, I'm going to just introduce Rita a little bit and then hear from you guys. So Rita Kaduri, right here, exhibit, exhibit A, um, is, I didn't know Rita had these amazing skills when I first met her. I met her in a meditation group, believe it or not, um, and then discovered as I was getting to know her that she has a very passionate commitment to helping people be at home with handling money like really understand it, be conscious of it, not be afraid of it, not be afraid either of having a lot or terror of having not enough, but to be comfortable with handling it consciously. Like we get more comfortable with our bodies or you know how to make food or so like why not money? So she is part of her job title is that she is a money coach or a financial coach, uh, helping people understand their own money situation and how to manage it better. Uh, and in that role, she's going to be with us tonight. She's also a financial planner and, and is, has that role as well. So and she will tell you more about that. But I wanted you to know, and I'm excited for you to experience her passion about putting money into plain talk so that you can maybe walk away and go, oh, I know why there's fees on mutual funds. And now I know where they go, and now I understand what front-loading means. You know, some of those kinds of words that you hear and then keep forgetting around um, investment products and so on. So, so that's Rita. She can tell you more. She's also got some great handouts for, for later ways of learning. Uh, but I just wanted to go around and hear from each of you just your name and if you live in the West End and what neighborhood you're in, in case you might be sitting next to your neighbor and not knowing it, it's a chance to meet them. And if you're not from the West End, what part of the city are you from? And um, maybe just a one sentence about what made you decide to come tonight? Maybe you can start, Penny. Oh, hi, hi everybody. I'm Penny. I'm from Anna Park. And I'm here because um, Joyce told me about it. And it just happened to coincide with an intention I set for myself that April was going to be a month where I was going to become fiscally responsible. So <laughs> good here I am. Good. Excellent. Yes. I am Catherine. And uh, uh, I know nothing about money. So I really, really appreciate this uh, chance to write something. Oh, and I'm from um, Britannia area. Uh, hi, my name is Jordan. Uh, I actually have a commerce degree, um, and that's my mom, so a little biased. <laughs> but, uh, we had to come. <laughs> no, I was, it, I'm really interested. Uh, I haven't actually been to one of these before. I'm interested to see what your take on it. I know you work really hard on making it like very easy to understand, and while I do have a background in some of the jargon, uh, I want to see how it, uh, how you explain it. I probably pick some stuff up too. Uh, and I live downtown, just off of Elgin near the museum. 
Uh, hi, I'm Trish. Uh, I also live downtown across from the museum. Uh, I'm dating Jordan. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, I've been wanting to come to one of these seminars because, as you mentioned, when I hear Rita talk, she is very passionate and she's very, she's wanted me to understand money better, and especially she keeps saying, oh, you should do it as soon as you can. So that's what I'm trying to do. Adam, do you want to um, Yeah, I can say my name's Adam. I've been in Ottawa for, I'd say, six or seven years now, and just starting to get to know Slow West. I'm also just starting to think more about money, because I haven't had a lot for a while, but I'm starting to think about those kind of longer-term questions. Um, and I'm looking forward to this and the other series on um, how to how to grow in a way that's also sustainable financially, so, yeah, cool. I'm Murray, I just live over Byron in Churchill uh, area, and uh, <coughs> I, I sit here wishing I had come to one of these about 30 years ago, because <laughs> time's running out for me to, <laughs> to have, a, have everything in, in place for retirement. So I'm looking forward to it a lot, especially the plain language version of it all. I'm Bill. I live, also live in Britannia. I'm dating Catherine. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is something that I think from uh, the time we started a family together, we've been looking for some way to deal with our money that feels right and never been satisfied with the products that we find and find ourselves in. So it's a long-standing disquiet with what my money is contributing to without my consent. So I'm interested to see where things are at now. I'm, uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I also live in Center Town, South Belgium. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there we go. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was actually talked into coming here by my sister. So hopefully I'll just kind of see what this is all about. <laughs> I'm Janie. Um, I'm interested in the ethical uh, investing. Uh, I have <coughs> stocks and mutuals and locked in Lyra. Um, although my ex-husband is more my financial planner, although I took over his role, but um, since he wasn't into ethical investing, I'm looking to shift more into it. That's a good way. And you have from? Oh, oh sorry, yes. Stonebridge, the PM. The PM. Okay. Barney, right? Yeah. yeah. So Agnes, also from Park Um and we're a bit in the same situation. We've been looking and going ethical and looking at an alternative, but not happy with what is going on. I know pretty much nothing about uh, finances. You mentioned front loading, so for me it's associated with my washing machine. I am hoping to go home with a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's good. My name is Michael. I live in Tunney, the Tunney's Pasture area right now. Um, I kind of have been in sort of activist hippie circles, so like money, evil, evil, yeah. the root of evil, and then it's kind of like, and, and then getting more involved in like alternative community currency and just kind of seeing like, just there, there's problems with the money system, but there's ways to make it work, and part of me making things work for me is learning, like I have a low but stable income and like learning how to make wise choices and to plan and prioritize certain things and have a better sense of how to do that. It's, it's one of the reasons. So. so a little bit about Slow West. Um, does anybody not know what Slow West is? <laughs> Bill found it, Slow West. Uh, okay, so you guys pretty much know. Oh, Mikey, did you say you No, no, I, I, I no idea. Okay, so it, it so West has been going for, what, four years now? Four years? Four years. Um, it's, it's under the Transitions Ottawa umbrella of neighborhoods that are trying to, in a community way, move toward living more sustainably, more simply, more socially just, and kind of understanding the consciousness of that. What, what does it take? What do we have to change inside to be able to move in that direction? Plus the practicality of that. What is it we actually need to do? So. Um, so for, I started this learning series because I'm pretty embarrassed to see what some of my mutual funds go to. They don't sort of match the slow-west values. So 
we'll, we have a learning series that covers a lot of things, and we'll have four that have to do with money. Tonight won't be as specific about where are the ethical investments, where are the green investments, because first we need a foundation to understand the whole process of better money handling before we go into that. So, but that will be coming up in the following weeks. Okay, so let's see if there's anything else you need to know. Yes, when Rita will speak, it, you'll see, it's, it's, I, I saw most of her talk this afternoon, it's so rich and so full that it works better if we save the questions till the end. Uh, so we've actually got note paper and pens in the back. Because you may be saying, what do you mean by that? Or it, you may want to write down questions. Or you may want to take notes, because she may suggest something, and you'll go, oh, wait. So if you want to take a moment and get note paper, she will have a question and answer period at the end. And then we'll have a time to talk with each other about, well, what did I get from that? And what am I trying to do financially here? And maybe we can help each other a little bit at that time. And it's a chance to get to know each other as well. You can also help yourself to tea at any time. Just you just turn the tea thing on, and, and uh, there's lots of tea there. Catherine brought. So okay, okay. Well, I want to welcome you, and of course, there it is. Uh, as you see, the sign says "Well Played, Women and Men." Men <laughs> is an adjunct. What I'll give you a little background. I started Well Played Women as a financial literacy program for women in particular because I thought that they were more in disadvantage and they needed to have a better understanding of their, what I call financial health. And so I, I targeted that group to begin with. And over the years, what I've been hearing was women saying, it'd be nice if we had a, a mixed group so that my partner or my son or anybody could come in as well. And I said, I have no objection to that. I have male clients. I mean, I'm not I, I'm not against having men. I just targeted women to get them up and, and, and involved in their uh, financial matters. And I wanted to provide them with a safe environment. So now, this is one of the first open groups, because Slow West came and said, you know, can you do this? And, and I said, great. So that's why the, the end men. <laughs> so it's not that we're discriminating against you. It's just I started with the women, but now I found that men also are, are really hungry for this kind of information. And what I always point out to my women when I'm doing a group a session is to say, look, there are no stupid questions. None. There's no reason why you should know this stuff. We have never been taught it in schools. Uh, they're the odd person that maybe had a particular interest in, in money and they went and bought some books and that. How I got started was I was sitting at a wealth watch, uh, Weight Watchers meeting one, many years ago, and money was a problem at that time. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, you know what? I said, I need the equivalent of Weight Watchers, but for my money. You know, so we had something like that where I could go and talk. Because at Weight Watchers, we had women that were uh, there exchanging. We had little. Uh, I don't know if anybody been to Weight Watchers, but Weight Watchers, the, the format is that they had a little talk, and you learn something uh, about managing your weight, and then we have a dialogue, you know, question and answer, and sometimes the answer came from the facilitator, and sometimes it came from the, the other participants, because they've been in the same situation. I said, that would be great to have. So that's my vision down the road, and I started this kind of Weight watch, or what I called Wealth Watchers meetings, and I've been doing them in government departments for the last four or five years now. And that's why they're, they're very restricted to people that work in that department. And, and, and that. so now this is a great opportunity for me to open it up to a group that, you know, is both uh, men and women and uh, different ages and different backgrounds, okay? So, like I said, no stupid questions. If there are any terms that come up don't wait, and, and you know, like you don't understand a term that's been there, put your hand up and ask, because you probably aren't the only one. I'm trying, I try very hard not to uh, use a lot of jargon, but it, you know, I mean, it is what it is. So put your hand up, say, what does that acronym mean, or what does that, those letters mean, or what is that? That's okay, but anything that's, if I feel it's going to take a, lot to, a long time to, dis, uh, to explain it, We'll put it off, and we'll, we'll, we'll answer it at the back. So don't hesitate to, to uh, uh, ask a question if you feel it's going to impede you from undergoing further. Okay. So first of all, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I am a financial advisor, as Joyce pointed out. I am a licensed 
to sell mutual funds and insurance products, okay? So that's one side of my business. On the other side, I have Wealthwise Women, which is a, what I call Wealth Coach Education and Assessment Services, and we'll get a little more detail as to what that means. My credentials for that are that I have a master's degree in planning, and I must very consciously let you know it's not a degree, a master's degree in financial planning. It's community planning. So again, that's where my background uh, and the holistic approach to doing something comes into play. So I think this is a very good mix with the slow west. Because even though I'm not talking to you about ethical in uh, investing and stuff, I feel that it, it's a fit because I think it's important that we understand all the parts and how they fit together, and then you can move from there a lot better and take better care of what you've been given. Okay, and then I have a degree in, in geography, communication arts, and information math. Okay, the other thing that I have to point out that Armstrong and Quail is the company that I work from or with in terms of products. They have nothing to do with this. They are not liable. So if I say anything that you don't like or whatever, don't go back to them. So that, that's just a little disclaimer I have to do. Okay. Now, what I want to use is sort of an analogy here with the financial advisor, financial coach, and, and, and give the analogy with the medical profession. So in the medical profession, we have doctors and we have pharmacists, right? So you go to the doctor, they do a diagnostic, they do an assessment, and then based on that, they'll, they'll write you a prescription. <coughs> you take the prescription and you go to the advisor, uh, the, uh, the pharmacist, and you fill the prescription, okay? In the financial industry, the tendency is that both of them are under the same roof. You get an advisor who's selling products, basically a pharmacist, quote unquote, and uh, they are also giving you advice. And that's the question, is, is it objective advice? So, you know, that's something that, again, we're going to maybe discuss later on in the evening, you know, how do you feel about that? Um, so, in terms of a, a, a products that the, your advisor or uh, will, will deal with is basically insurance and investments services here. In my case, I'm offering financial literacy, the program, the little orange sheet that you have there, we'll talk a little bit more about it. There, we'll be doing more sessions over at the First United Church, uh, continuing on. So that's the literacy part. And then the other part that I do is wealth care assessment, and, and but again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So let's look at services, financial literacy. This is the wealth care program that we will be uh, following through with and it's on all the details are on there so I, will, I just wanted to highlight that right now and this little crest here whenever you see that on the slide going forward that means that this subject matter I will be dealing with in greater detail at that learning series okay so I can't go into detail in all of these different areas but this will indicate that okay if you want to know more about it then it'll be covered in the other series okay so what I've got here is the word wealth equals financial health. So from now on, whenever you hear the word wealth, I'd like you to think in terms of your financial health. I once said to a woman something about her wealth, she said, well, I have no wealth. I said, everybody has wealth. If you look at it as financial health, the question is, what condition is it in? Are you in good health, bad health? <laughs> you know, and so we all have this wealth and we, we tend to you know, be like ostriches. We put our heads in the sand and and, and say it'll take care of itself. I, I, you know, I don't want to deal with it. It's not. You can't look in a mirror like you do, you know, for your weight and say I'm overweight. It's it's a lot easier to disguise and, and deny. Okay. So, in terms of our financial health, I've identified what I call some of the disabling deeds. So, uh, like with your uh, physical health, there are things in the environment, viruses, flus, things like that that can affect your, your your physical health. And if you're in good physical health, when those things come through, you're in much better shape to handle. If you're in bad physical health, then you get hit hard, right? And it could be quite disastrous. So some of the things that affect our financial health are death, divorce, downsizing, disability, accident, disease. And then I have another column here called debt, delay, delinquency. And why did I separate these two out? Well, on the left-hand side, these are things that happen from the outside. You can't really uh, control them. But you can in the way, like I said, if your financial health is uh, strong, 
then when it happens, you're better able to deal with things. The other one on the death, delay, and delinquency, those are your own behaviors, attitudes towards your financial health. So death, if you, again, we'll talk about it not tonight, but later on, there is good and bad debt. Uh, how, how are you dealing with that? You know, have you, got take, have you taken on more debt than you can afford? So then there's delay. That's procrastinating. And we heard about it tonight. English, but part of it, too, is we, don't, we didn't understand. I, I'm with you. 30 years ago, I knew nothing about this. Okay? Nobody told me. So delay means you put it off, and now you're a few years away from retirement, or you're in retirement, you're saying, I wish I'd known more about it, and I could have prepared better. So we've got some young people here tonight, and hopefully, you know, that will help them going forward. Delinquency would be using your money very unwisely, you know, uh, squandering it, essentially, not being aware. As Joyce was saying, you know, we have been given so much in our society. We, and, and as such, we, you know, we have responsibility to, to husband it very well, you know, or as best we can. And that means knowing how to do it. So delinquency would be really going to the nth degree in, in, the, in, the, in the opposite way, going and, uh, let's say, gambling your money away, or, um, you know, maybe drinking it away, or, you know, being very, very unresponsible un, uh, with money. So those areas there, you can do something about. The other one, you can, in a way, by being financially healthy. And so the idea is don't be like the ostrich. So we're going to move forward, and we're going to say, OK, on the positive side for our financial health, and this is what we're going to focus on, what are the ways that we can help with our financial health? And I've got the enabling A's. And this goes back. So this little chart that we have, it's, it's based on systems theory. So you go, we, have, we acquire the money, then we allocate it. So we spend it in different ways. So we, we're allocating it to different things. Then, ideally, we assess how we did that. Did we do a good job? Are we, are we on track? Are we doing OK? Now, that's an area, I think, in our society that we know very little about, OK? And that is an area that I want to focus on in the sessions going forward, is how do we, how do we assess? I had clients, a young couple, they both had a good job. They both had pension plans. They had two young kids. Their mortgage was just about to be paid off. They had RSPs. And I was leaving their house, and she took me by the arm, and she said, are we OK? Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, you're the poster kids. They didn't know. They didn't even know that they were OK. So not only for those who aren't OK, those that are OK, they don't even know. So she's worrying. So I'm saying if we had a way to, like, when you go to Weight Watchers, you step on a skin. And it tells you. And it says, oh, you're a bit up or you're a bit down, you know? You get an idea. We haven't got that. So this is part of what we, I would like to talk about. Once you get the assessment, of course, you want to adjust. So if your assessment says, you know, you, we're spending far in excess of what we're bringing in, we have to do something. Where are we going to do that? So you can adjust the allocation, how are we spending it, or you can adjust the acquisition. You know, we got to get more money in here, OK? So let's look at each of those just quickly. So acquire, this is the legal approach. But, you know, how do you acquire money? Has anybody ever seen this little diagram here? This is from uh, um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Rich Dad Poor Dad. There you go. <laughs> it's a good dad, poor dad. Rich Dad Poor Dad is a book that was very popular a few years ago. So he, he identified four different areas where you can acquire money through your labors. Okay? One of them is employment, and the other one is self-employment. And on this side here, it's your labor you're putting into it. You're working for money. Okay. On the other side, we've got business, and we've got investments. This is the side where money is working for you. So the difference between a business and self-employment is that with a self-employment, for example, you have a one-man shop, uh, you're an electrician, and, and you hire yourself out. If you go on holidays, is the money coming in? No. <laughs> But if you have a shop and you have a whole bunch of electricians working for you, and that's your business, and you go on holidays and those guys are still working for you, that's a business. Okay? So that's the difference. Investments are like that. 
your money is working for you. If you have money invested and they're working for you, then you can go and, or you can work or not work and, and they're still working, okay? So people are, most of us are on the left-hand side here. And, uh, but when we get into retirement, guess what? We're over here. And we don't know anything about this side. It's a whole different way of, this is one thing that Rich Dad Poor Dad talks about, is that there's a whole different mindset. So not only do you not know about it, your mindset is, you know, like you're scared of it. And that's the important thing now. Let's learn about how these things work so that when we do get to retirement and we are depending upon them, then, you know, we understand how to, how to husband them or how to manage them so that they work for us to our advantage. The other way that we acquire money is OPM. Anybody know what that stands for? <laughs> Other people's money. So you can borrow money, and, and that's called leveraging. So you borrow, like you borrow that to buy a house. Okay, you borrow from the bank. That's ideal. Okay, so you acquire money that way, or you go acquire money through credit cards, which is not necessarily a good thing. Okay. So once you've acquired this money, either through your labors or through investments or whatever, then you're going to allocate it. Okay, so let's look at how we allocate. What are the basic areas that we allocate? I've identified four different categories. So once you get your money, the first thing that happens is the taxes come off. Okay, and if you're a, a tithing, and most people understand what tithing is, you give a percentage of your income to a charity, a church, or whatever you belong to. So let's say, 10%, 15% automatically comes off the top, and you say, that's how much I contribute to my church community or whatever, that's time. So before you start spending anywhere else, you go and contribute. Then you put some money aside for your cultivate and conserve. So you buy assets, you buy investments, real estate, etc., And those are things that potentially can grow over time. So they're future oriented. Then you might say, okay, we need some life insurance or any other kind of insurance to protect what we've got so far. And we have to maybe look at estate planning, depending on where you're at, okay? And then after that, there's lifestyle expenses and debt expenses. So if you borrowed for your house, to buy a house, then you've got those expenses. And then you've got just your other shelter expenses, your food, your clothing, your entertainment, just basic stuff like that, transportation. So those are the four basic areas that you're allocating your, your, your money to. The problem is that the ideal situation is that we go in the area, in the direction that I said. You know, first of all, you get the taxes off, you put your tithing, then you look at it and say, how much do we need to put aside for the future? And you put that aside. Then you say, oh, well, we need to spend some money on insurance here, we'll put that. And then what's left over is what we have left over for lifestyle expenses. But guess what? Oh, sorry. Uh, what happens is, in most cases, is that we go the opposite way. We go from there to there, and we say, oh, after the taxes, this is how much we've got to spend. We can afford this kind of house, we can afford that trip or whatever. And then at some point, somebody knocks on your door and says, oh, you want to buy some life insurance or whatever. Something triggers it and says, oh, yeah, we should have some. Ooh, we don't have much money left in the budget, but we can spread a little bit and get a little bit of insurance. And then when RSP season comes along, then they even scrape some more. And they say, ooh, we really should do this, you know. And so they, they put a little bit of money aside. So ideally, what you do is you change the behavior. One change, and you help yourself immensely. Okay? So that's one thing that we need to look at. The other thing that, like I mentioned earlier, is the assess the allocation. How do we go about assessing the allocation? Have we done a good job in those four <coughs> categories? Have we got enough investments? Have we got enough insurance? Are we, are we over uh, uh, extended in the debt ratio? You know, have we got too much debt for, for our income? So the assessment, you can, very few people can do it on their own. I've got a little booklet that I put together at my other session that I handed them out to people. There's a manual thing, how to budget, how to calculate your debt ratio, how to, how to uh, estimate how much retirement, all that. I've yet to see one person do it. Come back and say, have you done it? No. no. And I can understand, we're busy, and it's not our favorite thing to do. So ideally, you know, you have, if you have an advisor or a coach, they would encourage that, and also they would provide the expertise in the direction. So what we've got here 
is ideally what I'm saying is the the coach will take a more holistic approach, ideally, and then the advisor tends to, but not always, there's some that go into doing the holistic as well, I'm not painting with them all to say, but the tendency, and that's where the industry der uh, derived from, it was a products industry to begin with, and now they're branching out and saying we've got to help with the planning. So they, there are many that are doing more planning. So there in the products area, they can help you with your investments in your life insurance and estate plan. So let's look at the products. One of the, product, one of the questions that you might have in their assessment is, well, what do I need? And where do I get what I need? And how much do I need? Those are questions, you know, to know so that you can assess whether you're on track or not. And we've got the wealth coach that's doing that. And my bone of contention, and that's just my opinion here, is that this question of how much needs to be put over here on, on another under another wing so that it's more objective. It's not tied to products. Even though a lot of advisors are very conscientious and, and they're not going to sell you something that you don't need but then again it's very hard to identify you know are you selling me this because you know this is your business to sell things or are you selling it are you telling me I need this because I really need it you know so if, if we can separate the two then there's a chance that it's a little more objective so after you've assessed then we adjust as I said and you can adjust the allocation and you can adjust the acquisition so if you adjust the, uh, the uh, how much money you're making or you know, uh, how often, how many hours you put in or maybe get a better paying job, or you can adjust uh, how much you're uh, borrowing. You can increase it, decrease it, whatever. You know, so once you assess that. And then in terms of your allocation, again, you've got your financial pro uh, advisor here, you've got insurance, you've got investments, okay? So let's take now, again, I can't look at everything tonight, but we're gonna look at the investment product side of the, the thing, not the insurance, that's for another time. Okay, so under product, like I said, what, what do I need, where do I get with me? And that we will look at more detail in the, in the upcoming sessions that are on that little orange sheet there. But for now, I'm going to just go and do a sort of a, uh, an overview of the products. So again, this is going to get a little more technical, like what kind of products, what they're called, and things like that. So again, if I'm moving too quickly or if I'm using jargon that you don't understand. Okay. So in the, under investment products here, there are two, there were, and there's one more now, two major, major categories. One of them is called guaranteed investments. The other ones are called investment securities. Under guaranteed investments, we have things that you normally would find at the banks. You get the GICs, CDs, uh, savings account, T-bills, Canada savings bonds, CSB is Canada savings bonds. Those things, as the name suggests, are guaranteed. You give the bank $1,000, put it into a Canada savings bond, and X number of years later, they give it the $1,000 back plus the interest that they promised you. No ifs, ands, or buts, right? Pretty guaranteed. Same with GICs. You give them $1,000, you write a contract with them, they say, I'm going to leave it here for five years. If you leave it for five years, you get 2.5%. If you leave it for one year, you get half a percent. It depends on the interest rates that are going. Uh, in the economy right now, they're not paying a lot because interest rates are very low. <coughs> Other times they have been high, but you're locked in for that period of time, but it's guaranteed, okay? Under investment securities, we have two different types. We've got bonds and we've got stocks, and then these bonds can be uh, subclassified into government and corporate, and the stocks are preferred in common, and then it can be broken down even more, which we're not going to get into today. Now, mm -hmm. Is everybody familiar with the difference between a stock and a bond? No. No. You ever hear of the term loaner, owner? Be an owner, not a loaner? The difference between a stock and a bond is this. Somebody comes up to you, uh, a relative or whatever, and they're starting a business. And they said to you, gee, you know, I could really use some help here, and if you invest in my, in my business, I, you know, if you lend me the money, let's say $10,000 or whatever, you lend me that money, I promise to pay it back to you in two years' time, and each year that it's out there, I'll give you 3%. So every year you get 3% on that money, and then at the end of the 
contract or understanding, you get the full amount that you lent, loaned plus the interest, right? Pretty safe. So when you're talking about government bonds, especially Canadian, or, and you know, not, not Cypriot, <laughs> if you're in Cyprus, Cyprus, you know, you know, it's not so guaranteed, but most government <laughs> bonds are very, very safe. Uh, and and the corporate bonds, again, we've got bonds that are, some are more secure than others because if it's a new company, they're less <coughs> stable than a blue chip company. They call them blue chips. You know, these are well established, big companies, big banks, and things like that. They're not going to default. <laughs> well, some banks have, but you know, on the whole, uh, you know, so they're they're bonds that have more or less risk, but they're pretty safe. You know, they're pretty safe. The difference, though, now is this person says, okay, I, you know. I'll give you a part of my company instead. Instead of lending you the money, uh, lending me the money, you buy into my company. I'll give you, you know, if you put ten thousand dollars in, I'll give you a tenth of the company. That's what it's worth. Okay. Now, if the company succeeds and this company grows by leaps and bounds, then your one tenth of the company, of course, is worth a heck of a lot more. If it doesn't succeed and it goes the other way, your tenth of the company is worth a lot less. That's the difference. More risk involved, but more potential for greater returns. Okay, so that's the difference between a stock and a bond. And that's what the stock securities investments are all about. So, as I was saying here, very low risk, or, or the rate of return is how much interest or, or uh, capital gain or, or return are you expecting to get from this kind of investment? So, a guaranteed investments are low risk. So they're going to give you a low return. Bonds are medium risk, and this goes medium to high risk. So again, associated with the risk is, uh, associated with the rate of return is increased risk. So you have low to no return, none to low, moderate, low to moderate, and moderate to high. So as we go up into the more risky investments, the, the rate of return can get higher, but uh, you're taking on a bit more risk. And not all stocks are risky, risky. They, again, they range from moderate, low, moderate to high. So if you're talking about stocks in the gold mines or other, you know, uh, precious metals, they're, they're much riskier than something that, uh, uh, say, a bank, you know, if you're buying stocks in a bank, it's a little more stable. So not all stocks are risky. Okay, so. What we have here is, again, just to make it more visual for you, your guaranteed investments are like your public transit. From the turn of the century, that's what people guaranteed investments, and that's basically what the average person felt comfortable or had the money to invest in. The investment securities were like the rich people in those days, they could afford to have a custom-built car, and that's how cars were built in those days, one by one, and custom-built, and only the rich could afford them, okay? So again, stocks and bonds and buying that, going into that, it's complicated, you need a lot of money and everything, a fair amount of money. So these are the two options that most people have. You either have guaranteed investments or investment securities. But in order to get a diversified portfolio here, this is what we want. When we want product, we don't want to buy just one stock. What happens if that, you put all your $10,000 into one company and it doesn't do well? What if you could put 1,000 in, in, in 10 different companies? And then, you know, then the chances are that some of them, if not most of them, will be okay, and the ones that aren't will be compensated for. So when you have a portfolio, what you do is you want to have a diversity and you want to have a range of stocks, but the stocks are expensive. So if to have, let's say, 50 stocks in the portfolio, you need about 100 shares per stock, and that's at $35 a share. So that gives you $3,500 per stock, and you need about 50. So we're talking $175,000 to get a well-diversified stock portfolio. Maybe a little exaggeration here, maybe a little less, but still 100,000 before you have a good diversification. So if you don't have 175,000, one of the solutions is mutual funds. And so what is a mutual fund? It's like the Henry Ford of automobiles. So Henry Ford decided at one point, you know, he wanted to make build an automobile. He, he put them on an assembly line. He cut the, 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 there's no customization. It's one model, one color. Everybody gets the same, and uh, that way he could make a, a an automobile that was affordable to the average consumer. Okay, and as with Henry Ford, that's the mutual funds we have today. We have much more diversity than one 
model and one color, don't we? So the same with mutual funds. It started that way. So what was a mutual fund to begin with? It's like a room of us here. We all have, let's say, about $10,000 to invest. We don't have enough to go into the stock market. I mean, we don't know enough about it, right? But we all have $10,000. So with, with all our money joint, we have over $100,000 here. So we get together and say, look, why don't we get together and bring this to, to an expert? And, and let a stockbroker and let them build us a portfolio and uh, you know we'll all benefit from that expertise well that's what a mutual fund is so a mutual fund is a fund company they get a fund manager who goes out and puts together a group of stocks a group of bonds or a group of stocks and bonds and they are there managing that portfolio and you can buy a little share of that you don't have to buy the whole thing, you buy a little share. And if, that's, if that portfolio of stocks goes up, so does your share go up. So that's what a mutual fund is. So here we have a pool of money managed by an experienced professional. It's affordable. You don't, with as little as $100, you can buy part of a, of a mutual fund. You don't have to buy you know, a stock, one stock. It's very liquid. You can redeem them at any time, unlike a GIC, where you have um, uh, you have it's locked in. They're diversified. They got a, a bunch of stocks in there, and then they're flexible. So we've got three different kinds. We have the growth. We have fixed income and balance. So those are basic types. And again, uh, there's over 4,000 mutual funds now to choose from. So you say to yourself, well, how do I? Some of them are made mainly of stocks. Those are called growth uh, uh, mutual funds. Bonds are fixed income, which are made, mainly made up of bonds. And the balanced uh, fund is made up of both stocks and bonds. Okay? So what you want is your uh, advisor to go in and pick now the right kind of mutual funds for you. It's got some, yes? Sorry, could you go back to the last slide? <laughs> stocks. Okay, so a growth fund, so if you go in and you talk to your advisor and say, you know, that there are growth funds or equity funds, sometimes they call them equity funds, those are funds that are made up of stocks. So they're going to be a little more volatile than a fixed income fund. A fixed income fund, and then again, why do they make these names? I don't know. <laughs> but a fixed income fund is made up primarily of bonds, and maybe it's because this kind of fund is is desirable for people who are retired and that will be drawing a, a fixed income from their investments and so they can't deal with the, the volatility of stock bonds are much it's gentler right they don't they don't go up and down as much so the bonds go like this so you want a fixed income or a bond fund when you're retired if you're taking the money out uh, uh, so much per month so that if the markets go down like this and not like that with the stocks you're not going to be feeling it can I ask a few questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so growth or equity, the, the trying to make more money works better if you have like like a better, like a bigger income kind of thing. Like if you have a big income, then you have more stability if, it, the, if, the, if the stocks will fluctuate versus if you have like lower income, the stable is better. It's okay, better. Yes, and, and yes and no. If your time horizon is such that you've got 20 years before you're going to need this money, Okay, the ups and downs are not going to matter so much. Okay, so it's not so much whether you're low income or not. It, you know, it's it's whether you have the time to let the, the let the thing go and do its bumpy ride because because stocks tend to go up like this, but they bump up and down like this on their way up, whereas bonds go like this. You know, they're much gentler, but they don't go as high. Okay, so if you've got 10, 15, 20 years, you can deal with the little bumps. But if you're going to be taking your money out bit by bit every month, then then you don't want these ups and downs. So you want a bond or a GIC or something very stable like that. And then a balance fund, of course, has both in it. So they're in between. It's not, it's not as solid as a bond, but it's not as bumpy as that. So they can, they can mitigate each other. So in terms of the product, you want to put together a portfolio. A portfolio is a group of funds that put your money, right? You're not going to buy just one fund if you've got $10,000, you know, or 15 or 20. You want to mix it up now. Again, diversity being our objective. 
So we we got equity funds, we've got fixed income, we got balance, and then furthermore we can we can subdivide it up to domestic, foreign, and then within that we have other categories, and I'm not going to go into them now. But that shows you the diversity and the complexity of it. <laughs> um, the people who uh, organize these are the companies that organize and manage them and make sure. Uh, th these are not guaranteed the rate that you get back no. from them? No, because they're made up of stocks and bonds, and the stocks and or bonds are not guaranteed. So basically what they've done is they've bought some. Their job is to go and select from all the stocks and bonds and choose the, the ones that they think are going to grow and understand the industry and, and where the markets are going and things like that. So they, they bring a certain expertise. But as a consumer, you could almost feel like, because how do we pay for this service of, uh, okay. of managing these things? And you can almost feel like they're guaranteed because you're paying somebody to manage them. Okay, yeah. right. we'll, we'll go into the, the payment in a while because that that's a big question on everybody's mind. And I, it's so convoluted the way you know it's done in the industry, but I, I, I was saying to Joyce, I think I, think, I, think I got it you know, <laughs> down to simplify it to a point where I think I, if you understand it, then I've, I've achieved my goal. Okay. Rita, just for, for a moment, because some people came in late, we've suggested to hold questions that, that want lots more information, because there's going to be a time at the yeah. end. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you can take notes and write Take your questions notes, in. and then we'll go in. But definitely ask a question if you, you need a little clarification of a term or something. Yeah. Okay, so what I've done here is I've gone in and I've chosen a, a group of funds, like from that different, uh, from equity, domestic, and everything else. These are funds from, this is from a dynamic fund, DYN is for dynamic. So dynamic is a company, it's a mutual fund company that builds mutual funds, okay? Fidelity is a manufacturer of mutual funds. Uh, Dynamic again, AGF is another manufacturer. Just like you have different manufacturers of cars, right? You have Ford, you have Toyota, you've got Mazda, you've got different companies. They all build cars and then they all make a sedan, they all make a minivan, they all make a sports car, you know, the model. So each of these companies, Dynamic, all they all have equity, domestic, small cap or large cap or you know, that kind of fund. So I went in there and I chose different kinds of funds to put together a portfolio, okay? Then, you say, okay, I, I, want it, I want these products, okay, so this is what I need. I need a variety of funds, I need a diversification, I need it built, you know, uh, so that it, it, it's designed for me. If, I, if you're uh, 30 years old here and starting up and you've got 20 years or 30 years before you retire, that's a whole different portfolio than somebody who's 50, 55, 60, you know, and so depending on your situation, your time horizon, your comfort, your comfort level with risk and all that kind of thing, I'm going to design a different portfolio for you, okay? So, but where do I, where do you as a consumer go to get these things done, right? So, again, we're going to go into detail in the upcoming series, but in the meantime, I'm going to give you an overview again. So, we have mutual funds. We have what they call independent MGA. MGA stands for um, Managing General Agency. Why, well, I don't know. But anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a law of laws. It's a, it's a department store that sells just mutual funds. So that's your dealer. The dealer that I'm working with right now is Armstrong and Quail. Okay, so I'm their, uh, their pharmacist, the pharmacy, that sell, and they sell a variety of funds. So I can go and select funds from many different manufacturers. I can go to Fidelity, I can go to McKenzie, I can go to AGF, I can go to Dynamic, and I can go to the banks. The banks also sell uh, mutual funds. I can go RBC, Dynamic, because I deal through a department store, right? So my pharmacy that I deal with has that. So if you go to the bank, you can go to the bank, you can go to RBC, Scotia, BMO, uh, you name it. Uh, all the banks now manufacture their own mutual funds. It's easy. They go and they buy the, the stocks, bonds, and they have people that really basically manage the fund. So that's, they're, they're selling a product. So RBC has their own funds. Uh, 
TD, B, BMO, and everything else. So you go to RBC and you say, you know, I want, I want a mutual fund. Well, they're going to sell you their product. And they have a range, okay? They have a range of selection, like I said, just like in car manufacturing. They have the different models, just like everybody else. But they're going to sell you those models, okay? The mutual fund dealer, some of them have their own products. So, for example, the one that I've chosen to give an example here is something like Investors Group. Investors Group is not like uh, uh, the MGA. They have their own product and they have their own sales people. So you go to Investors Group, they're going to say, okay, here, I'll put a portfolio together. These are the products that I have to work with. Okay? So you have, so what I did is I put the portfolio together the one that from an independent, one from a bank, and one from a mutual fund dealer, and we're going to compare them. So here we have, like I said, I chose here, I went on to my, uh, and I'll show you the software in a minute, and I chose what I thought was the best one. There, there are many different companies have small, small cap funds, but I chose the one that I thought was doing the best. Then I could go into a global markets, and I said, okay, who's got the best one of that? And in terms of fixed income, who's got the best uh, bond? Who's got the be best balanced fund? Whatever, okay? And I, I do my comparison, and I can select. Then I went to these companies. I went to TD. In this case, again, I didn't, they're not better or worse than any other bank, and I wanted to show you a bank. So a bank here, TD, I took, and I found the, the equivalent kind of fund, and this is uh, small business and equity, whatever. I didn't, I went to BMO here because TD didn't have this kind of fund here. So that again shows you they didn't have it. But they, they basically have all those categories. But they only have their, <coughs> their brand. And then I went to Investors Group and I chose again the same type of fund but their brand. Okay? So what we're going to do is look at the returns or how did these things do. So what is, what is this thing that you're seeing on the, on the screen? What that is is um, it's a chart. There's a program called Paltrack that I subscribe to, and it gives me historical data on all the funds across the board in Canada, over 4,000 of them, okay? So I can go in and I can say, this, these group of funds that I put together, that created portfolio C, A, and B, okay? I put them in there, and the, the program backdates it. It can't tell me what it's going to do in the future, but it can go back. So I went, this was in 2010 I put this together, so I went back to 2006 to 2008, and I said, okay, how did they do each of these, okay? So Portfolio C, which is the investors group one, made about 9.7% return over uh, four years? Let's see, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah, over four years, okay? Uh, and then Portfolio B, but not be 9.9 .9, and portfolio C, uh, portfolio A, the one with the different companies, that made 36% uh, return. Okay, so it made a better return. If, for those who don't un feel comfortable with graphs, this is it in dollars and cents. Okay, so I put 70,000 in each one of them. So in April of 2006, portfolio A with the diversified uh, mixed portfolio. Made, it, it came out with 95, went from 70 to 95. This one went from 70 to 77, and that one from 70 to 77, okay? So you say, oh, wow, that one's got much better returns, but you ask, but was it riskier? Did, that, did you have to take a lot of extra risk to get that return? So again, the program is really nice, and it does this uh, uh, assessment here, or it's called a risk return report. And here on this graph, the, the, on the vertical, it tells you how much the return was. And on the horizontal, it tells you how much risk. The, the farther along, the higher the risk, the higher the volatility. Okay? So we've got two here at about 17 and one over here at 13. So let's see which ones are high, riskier. Portfolio B and C, the ones that were at the bank and investors, were riskier than the one that was diversified from there. So what I'm saying here is that it, just because you're getting better returns doesn't mean you have to take more risk. But you're, ideally, what you're trying to get at when you're de designing a portfolio is to optimize the return but minimize the risk. And you can do that by, by doing your assessment. So again, I was going to say to Joyce, 
when you're talking to whoever it is that you your advisor, you can ask them, do you, how do you select the funds that are, you're putting in my portfolio? Do you have Paltrack? Can you show me? How are they doing? You know, relative to, I didn't put on this one, and I did on some of the other slides, but you can put it at, at, at the uh, S&P TSX, you know, the index, and say, okay, are they outperforming the index? Are they doing better than, they, than the market or less than? And that gives you an indication. You can't always beat it, but, you know, that's an indication. Okay, so that's one question that you could now say when you walk away from here is, I could go and ask my advisor, you know, what do you use to select your funds? What's in my portfolio? What's the mix? You know, is it diversified? <coughs> So it's not the other big part two here, and I gotta really move it because I can see we're running out of time. Okay, it's not only how much you make, but it, it, it's how much you keep. So the other side, so part of investing is, you know, knowing how to make your money grow, but there's a large part on the other side is saying not losing it through different means. So you want to minimize the tax, and everybody understands that the tax takes a big chunk out of things, and there are ways of minimizing the tax on your investments. <coughs> and if you do that, you don't have to get, you know, double-digit returns every time if you, you know, you save a lot through taxes. Minimize costs and minimize risks. So minimize tax, tax shelters, tax advantage, and that, we're not talking about that tonight, it's just, it goes too much into detail, we don't have time. But um, if you want to know more, come to the next sessions. Minimize costs, there are fees and commissions. Now, this is the thing. The fees, I'm not going to go into the commissions, is what the major area. And so we're going to look at products. You, they work based, basically from commission. There, there may be fees for service, and again, I'm not going to go into that, but most of it is commission based. And then the services, fee for service. That, that. So the big question that a lot of people have and don't understand is the commissions. Okay, so how are you paying for these products? When you're buying a guaranteed investment, the, the cost of, of the thing, the commission is built into it. You have no idea what the commission is. Okay, so forget that. But when you're buying investment security, stocks and bonds rate right from the broker, okay, so you go to the stock broker and you buy your stocks and bonds directly, you pay a percentage, and I think, it, I, if I'm not mistaken, but don't quote me, I think it's about 3%. So you pay 3% when you buy it, and then, let's say six months, eight months down the road, you say, oh, I need to sell it now, it's not doing very well, or it's doing really well, I want to take my profit out, or whatever. When you sell it, you pay them again. So you're paying them to do that buy and sell for you, okay? And that's the cost of doing business at a stock broker's. Now, they do have discount brokers <coughs> that go on and do it, and it's a lot cheaper and everything now. So, but that again, you need to understand what you're doing, and you know, there's a lot of expertise required. But if you want to do that, you can do it. So again, we've got, you buy, you know, you, pr you pay a percentage when you buy, when you sell with mutual funds. And this is where it gets complicated trying to explain to people. You pay when you buy or when you sell. You don't pay either, and you don't pay both. So you make a decision right up front. Am I going to pay the commission now when I'm buying it, or am I going to pay when I sell it? Okay? Or not at all. And I'm going to explain how you do it where you don't pay at all. Okay, so here is an example. So the, let's say the gross rate of return from stocks and bond invent, in, investments purchased by a fund manager. So here's the fund, the mutual fund. The manager goes out and buys stocks and bonds. And at the end of the year, this group of stocks and bonds that he's bought in, in his little fund has made 8%. Do you think you get 8%? Do they, do they work for free? Does anybody work for free? No. So, they take what they call an MER, it's called a management expense ratio. They take a percentage of the return. So if they do really well, they get more. If they don't do as well, they get less. Okay, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a fair trade-off. They have to pay their overhead. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression it wasn't on the return, it was a percentage of the entire stock value or fund value. Yeah, it is a percentage. Yeah, like I said, there's a, the, the fund, uh, uh, which is a group of stocks or bonds, makes a certain amount. So this group of funds at that time, in that year, made 8%, the group of them. Okay? And then from there, they take that MER off of it. Is that not what I'm, you know, are we... Well, it, just, it sounds like what I would take from that is if the whole thing made 8%, I also made 8% on my little bit, which makes it sound like the MER is just paid on my profit. No, 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 that's right. The MER is, so the, the fund 
manager and the fund company, yeah. they built a fund, and that fund itself made 8% from the stocks and bonds that they bought. Yeah, yeah, they and then they have to pay their overhead, they have to pay their, their fund managers, their staff, their, their rent. They, and then the other thing that they pay out of that is the commission's fees. Mm -hmm. Okay, but is it 8% of the total value of all the holdings or 8% of the increase? The percent, like the, the profit, the return. The, the return. So is it 8%? Like I buy $1,000 worth of mutual fund A, mm -hmm. and at the end it's worth $1,100. Do I pay 8% of $100 or 8% of $1,100? You, you're not paying this. This is what I'm getting at. This is, this is even before you get your returns. Okay, the, the return that you actually get is 6%. For the mutual fund gets six percent. So when they say your return this year is six percent, that's not what the group of funds actually made. They made eight percent, but they had to take, they took off. So in, for example, you manufacture a car. It costs so much in dollar, you know, in in in, in uh, materials and labor and everything else. It costs you ten thousand dollars to make, and then you add on, you know, your profit, which is another. Uh, five thousand. Okay, that's your profit. So it costs you fifteen thousand, right? So this is the reverse. It, they made eight percent from the stocks and bonds that they bought. The company, the company takes two percent for themselves. That's their profit. Okay, and then six percent is what your fund is going to give you. So if you were to cash that fund in today, you would get a six percent uh, increase. So your ten thousand dollars would make. Six percent. Yeah. It's, I, I, I still have the same confusion, which is, if I if I have a thousand dollars invested and I get and I earn a hundred dollars. Yeah. Does my advisor may or does the MER get taken off just of the hundred dollars, or does it get taken off the whole thousand dollars plus the hundred dollars? Because I think that's the confusion. Oh. Like it's a certain percentage of your whole investment. <laughs> My well, understanding paid. is it's your whole investment, but you never even hear about it. Like it's yeah. just taken That's off the before confusion. you even Maybe know about it. Maybe just another way to look at it. Let's say it, the stock makes nothing. It, it doesn't grow at all. Yeah. Is there any yeah. MER? Yes. Like, so even if they return nothing, there's still the management expense or is you. Yes. Yes. So, so, it is you would, so, so you would be in the hole. You would be that that stock would go down by two percent. That's what it's it's, okay. So they take their yeah, like, okay. yeah. So before you even see it, you get down two percent. So they have to make some money in order for you not to go in the hole. Right. So you have to pay for this expertise. If you had gone to the stock market and bought, oh, sorry, and bought this group of funds yourself, if you understood the stock market and you got, went there, and, and and you can do it online now. You could make your own eight percent, right? That's that's right. You can go and make eight percent, or zero and not lose or anything. zero and not yeah. lose anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Or zero make no, not lose anything, okay? Or even if let's say the market goes down uh, by by uh, they lose. Not only do they not break even, they lose. The markets go down and it's down by by eight percent. That eight percent and then another eight <coughs> percent would take your I MER. Mean, your loss is ten percent. So yes. It goes on either end. Mm -hmm. my, I don't know if this is the time to say it, but my, my feeling about mutual funds is that they, they seem really safe, so it always confuses me if, if, if a fund makes zero. How can a fund make zero when there are all these people out there if they, working uh, at it to, yeah, no, but with all their computer programs if, to When you saw that, 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 that chart, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the, the economy went into the, and it crashed. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, you cannot, this, their job is to try and do the best with, with the economy that's out there. The economy. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So there, uh -huh. there's a, there are two different the things. So <laughs> you're working yeah, on that. And then within that economy, and then there are fund managers that are doing better than others that go and select and understand. And, you know, that's their expertise. You're paying yeah. for their expertise. Yeah. Like I said, you can go to the stock market and go and do it yourself. It's like, you know, you can go build your own car. If you have the expertise and maintain it and everything else, but personally, I don't have the expertise nor do I have the time. Okay. So, so to clarify, I think the question in the room: Say I had a hundred dollars in this fund in the year, I would have had a hundred and eight if I did it myself. Yeah. But they take their two percent. Right. They don't take their two percent of my hundred and eight. Yeah. They, they do, take yeah. their two percent of my eight. Yes. Oh. So I get a hundred and six. Yes. I don't. I don't. 
That, that's yes. the question. Do they yeah, take well, the 2% of, the, the, of yes. the 108 or of the... No, 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 they subtract 2%. Oh, the they made 8% profit. profit, so they take 2% of the 8% of the profit. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You got it. Yeah. You so I end up with $106 instead of $108. Exactly. They've, they've done that expertise. Okay. Yeah, and that's what you're paying for. And if you don't think that they're bringing anything to the table, then go to the stock market. That each level that they, you know, do they bring value to it? And I personally, I don't understand enough of the stock market. You have to be on top of it. You have to know everything. I, it, you know, so they're providing a service. They're getting paid for it. If you think it's too much, and again, the MER varies with the type of fund. If you have a bond fund, you're going to pay a much lower MER because they're much less complicated. So you might be paying one, one and a half percent. Mm -hmm. And with a mer uh, of a stock fund, you're going to pay two, two and a half, three percent, depending on how complex it is. Also, on any of the, what they call the prospectus, or you go online and look at the fund itself, they will tell you what the MER for that particular fund is. Mm -hmm. If you think it's way out of the line, but normally what they do is they give you the MER for the fund and they'll say the average MER for this type of fund is. Mm -hmm. So if the average is one and you're paying two, you're going to say, well, you better be doing a hell of a job for me if you're going to be charging two. Okay? But, it, you know, normally they're in line. They're on average, you know, for different types of, of complexity and stuff. So there we go. Now, how does this affect? Like I said, out of the MER, they pay the trailer, they pay the commission here. So this is how your advisor gets paid. Okay. The dealer advisor, so in my case, it's, uh, Armstrong and Quail is the dealer. I'm the advisor, the salesperson working through there. I'm a pharmacist. And when I sell a fund, then I have two options. And I, I don't know if you've ever been offered this. If you go to the bank, they're going to say we, we do no load, meaning you don't pay any commission at all uh, at the beginning or at the end. You go to an independent, they're going to say, you have a choice. You can go front end or back end, meaning you can pay at the beginning when you buy it, or you can pay at the end when you sell it. So then you have FEL means front end load, and then no load is front end at 0%, basically. Okay. So if I sell a front end load fund to you, the mutual fund company pays the dealer and the advisor an annual trailer fee, so on an annual basis, while I'm managing it for you, okay, while you have it under me, I get a continuing annual thing of half a percent to one percent. So again, if it's a bond fund, you get less than if it's a mutual fund, um, a gross fund, or a stock fund. So if I sell you a bond fund, I'm going to get half a percent a year on that particular sale. Or if it's an equity, I get about a one percent. And these are just sort of ballpark. They're not exact, but you know, close enough. If I sell you, and I say to you, well, I'm going to sell you a back end. It's got declining sales charge or that over six years. That means that the you can, when you sell it, you're going to pay the commission at that end. You know, when you sell it. And if you sell it within the first six years, there'll be a, there'll be a charge to you. But after six years, there's no charge. Okay. A low load is three years. So if you buy at a low load for three years, if you don't sell it, that's fine. After three years, there's no commission. So you have to pay when you bought it, and you won't pay when you sell it. Okay. The reason that that happens is, and if you'll notice here, this is a half a percent if I sell you a front end, and I get a quarter to a half percent if I sell you a DSC. So why would I want to sell you a DSC fund? Why wouldn't I sell you a front end? Because I get a better trail. The reason being the cost will the value will go up. Huh? Really? No. When I make a sale, so there's a trailer fee that goes along with it. I manage your money. I have to do all the paperwork, and trust me, there is paperwork. And I uh, meet all these re stringent requirements. When I'm at the point of sale, the day that I sell it, one time charge, with a front end, I can charge you from 0 to 5% right up front. So the, the, the commission is paid. I normally don't do that. The banks say we, we charge you 0%. Most people, if they're doing front end, it's 0%. You know, and I would never accept anybody to say, I'll sell you a front end and, and charge you 5%, and then you don't have to pay the other end. Makes no sense. If I sell you a DSC, declining sales charge, 
I get, or not I, the dealer gets 5% and then I get my cut of that, okay? If I sell you a low load, they get, the dealer gets 2.5% and then I get my cut. Rate up a one-time payment. The reason for that is that the dealer, or the, the fund company, is prepaying the trailer fee for us, okay? The trailer fee, if I do it up here, is 5%. If I do it down here, it's a quarter of a percent, right? So I, I get half of my trailer, but I get more up front. So the, the, the mutual fund company is paying ahead of time the trailer fee. So they're going to reduce that trailer fee, and they're going to give it to me up front. So you say, OK, so these that commission and the trailer fee comes out of the advisor thing. So does it cost you anything then? Because that comes out of the MER. It does and it doesn't. If you go front end 0%, I, if I sell you something front end 0%, no load, I will get immediately a five or a half a percent or 1% on, on the thing going forward. If I sell you a DSC declining, from year one to year six, that fee will go down bit by bit. And after year six, there will be no more fees, okay? But I'll get my 5%, oops, sorry. I'll get my 5% rate right up front, and then I get a lower thing for the first six years. So I'll get a low fee for six years, but I get 5% up front, or 3%, 2.5% for, uh, for three years, and then a lower fee. And at the end of the of the, of the the DSC or the low load, it becomes mature and they become front end and then it moves up to there and you don't have any commission and I get a better thing. So it's a different way. Now, if you have 5, 10, 15 years before you retire and it makes no difference, you're putting it in an RSP, you're not going to touch it, then for me, if I sell you this, it's not going to hurt you and I get, some, I get paid up front. I get less there, but I get paid up front, and then over time. So let's look at the same thing. Here we have the, at the 8%. So this is a, you bought a mutual fund, and in year five, so you, bit, you left it in there for four years, and on day one of year five, you decide to cash it in, you redeem it. So then you go, you've got, it's 6% per year, for four years, you you made 24% increase on your on your mutual fund, right? But there's still some owing DSC fees owing on it, right? You only had four years; you haven't gone the full six years, so there's some DSC fees. That's and I'm assuming here about three percent. It depends. Each company is a little different how they how they decline the the fee. So that it starts at about six, and then five, four, three, two, you know, and something like that. So let's say. Year four or year five, you you cash it in. You have to you have your 24% uh, profit, but you're going to have to take 3% of that gain and pay it out as commission fee. So really, you you net only 19%. So it does impact you if you take your money out earlier than you had planned, or if somebody comes to me and says, "I plan to take this out in two years," then it would be unethical for me to put it into a six-year DSC. Yeah. Okay. All right. 21, right? Yeah, why would you be because of the 2%. Oh, oh sorry. Nine. I changed it on one. Okay. I mean, you're right. It's 21. Oh, okay. oh, that, that's just a trick to see if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it. I thought I didn't change it. I guess I changed it on It's 21% you would have gained. Okay, and then you pay that load or the commission fee once, not annually, and the loads decrease annually to 0% after six years. So let's look at the same one. You, it's in there for six years. You're in the seventh year. You want to cash it in. You made six percent per year on average, so you've got it. Four, uh, six six is a thirty-six. So over the six years, you made thirty-six percent. The loads are zero, and you net your six percent. Okay, but the problem arises if you're going to take it out early. Okay, and so that's important if you know your time horizon and stuff like that. We're running out of time. Yeah. So the other thing I want you to know about, which a lot of people do not know about, and it ties in with this DSC, churning. And this is where you as, a, as, as clients, as, as consumers, need to know because I've seen too much of it going on and, and you know, it's, it's ignorance. 
churning ex is excessive trade by a broker. And so if you're buying your stocks and bonds and you go to your stock broker and you buy it, and then six months later they say, oh, you should sell and buy this one over here. Well, every time you sell and you buy, they get a commission. And they do this, and they're doing it more frequently than maybe they should. And how do you know? You know, are they doing it because they're doing it in your best interest, or are they doing it because they're getting a commission by doing that? So that's where you have to be wary and say, do I really need to do this? So again, that's where, again, at a mutual fund, you don't have to deal with that because the fund manager is doing all that, buying and selling, and they know what they're doing. Okay, so that's churning. Beyond, but churning happens with mutual funds as well. And how does it happen? When you buy a, a mutual fund and they put you in the DSC, and we said, okay, after six years, it's mature. It goes in, it should go into a front end. You should never have to pay commission on it again. But what happens, and a lot of times, not a lot, but it can, and this is where you have to be careful, is your fund is matured now. You've had it in there six, seven, eight, nine years, whatever. And then they say, oh, look at this. Maybe we should change this fund to this fund over here. That's okay, you can change from one fund to another. But they don't put you in the front end of that new fund. They put you again in the DSC and you start the six years all over again. They get a commission and they get paid twice. Okay? That's churning and I've seen it and I and I you know, I can't do much about it when I see it, people coming to me, but be aware. So when your advisor is gonna tell you, let's switch funds, look at whether you're a DSC or a FEL. If you're a DSC and they're moving you into another DSC, that's fine. But if you're a front end, if your DSC is matured and that's now eligible to go into the front end, make sure they don't put you in a DSC because then you start another six years where there are commissions. Okay. When the mutual funds dealer association considers it illegal, is it illegal? It is, but you would have to make a complaint. Okay. And, you know, and, and then we'll, there are ways so minimize risks, and we'll go quickly into this. Financial industry, there's insurance uh, for the financial industry. There's regulations, and the regulations are there, and I do have uh, pamphlets uh, for all the different ones, and it tells you how to get in there, and how to check, and stuff like that. Financial products, or if they have guarantees, what are they all about, and the financial consumer literacy. So let's look at the insurance, uh, financial industry insurance. Um, again, more in detail later on. CDIC, Canadian Deposit Insurance, everybody knows that with the banks, okay? Well, guess what? The IPC that, uh, IPC Investor Protection Corporation is the equivalent of that for mutual funds, okay? And in all cases here, by the way, it does not protect you against loss in the, in the, in the market. It protects you if the actual company goes bankrupt. Same with the bank, you know, if the bank goes, under then your your deposits are insured and same with the thing the um the iroc which is the uh, association for brokers and stuff like that they have their own and assurus is the one for life insurance industry you know again you think oh what if i buy life insurance and the company goes bankrupt what happens so what they are insured sorry what was the uh, corporate one you were, you were talking about corporate uh yeah, the ipc ipc investor protection corporation fund the IBC is 25,000, how much is IBC? A million. So you're insured up to a million. I think CDC is up to uh, 100,000. It's up to 100,000, but it's only per account. And you think, oh, I'm gonna go put money in different branches, it doesn't matter, same bank. And it's only for deposits, not for your investments. Okay, so if you have mutual funds or whatever, then that doesn't cover it. But most of the banks belong to the IPC, the mutual fund one, so they're covering it. So most of that is legitimate. The important thing is that with the organizations here, um, okay, what we're gonna look at is the regulatory bodies. There are regulatory bodies here, and you can go and check to see if your the company that you're dealing with, the advisor, the company, is registered under the Ontario Securities Commission, if you're in Ontario, if you're in Quebec, it's l'autorité des marchés financiers. They, they're provincial organizations, and you go in there, and again, I've got brochures that you have to come to my other sessions, uh, that explain, you know, how you go in there and check. So if you're gonna, again, deal with somebody that you don't know, and you wanna find out, are they a registered advisor, are they a registered company with, with these things, you can go in there and it'll tell you. It'll tell you, it'll also tell you if they're having complaints. Then there is the, um, so there's a couple more here. 
Then uh, Mutual Fund Dealers Association has, a, again, they go in the Ombudsman for Banking Services or Investments. So there's all kinds of regulatory and security things done. The guarantees, there's guaranteed investment certificates, annuities, and seg funds. Again, these are guarantees on the products. Again, I'm not dealing with them here, but if you want to know more about that, come to the other one. Literacy. The industry protection does not safeguard against market conditions. So all these industry organizations, they can't protect you if the markets go down or up or whatever. What they, and the prod, financial product protection doesn't protect you against fraud. So, you know, if you're buying a product from a fraudulent company, it doesn't help, does it? So what does help is literacy. So it helps safeguard you against fraud or theft. For example, if, again, somebody approaches you with, oh, they're a good advisor, whatever, most of these scams are for people that are not within, within the industry, right? They're outside the industry. If you had gone to check to see if they were registered, you would have found out. You'd say, well, wait a minute, you're not in this. And if you do deal with somebody in the industry and you have a complaint, you have a mechanism to go in there and, and, and have it looked at, okay? You have all kinds of levels. So make sure that whoever you're dealing with is legit. Then the, okay, so then the last one here, I'm gonna go very quickly. The, the next part of the services is a wealth care assessment. And this is something new that I'm incorporating in my business right now because um, I found that what we needed was, was a more uh, uh, comprehensive uh, assessment of, of what you're doing, you know, a holistic. So this goes back to my planning training. So a retirement income assessment is integrated. It, it includes the CPP, uh, your public, private, and personal pension. So if you have, everybody has Canada pension stuff, uh, but if you have a company pension and you then have your own investments, how do they fit together? You know, all combined is it enough, you know? Um, and then if you have some other stuff. If it includes it, uh, all kinds of information on your lifestyle, employment expenses, debt expenses, all that kind of stuff in that, in that assessment, it's iterative. You can put in scenarios. You go and put the data in and you say, well, if I retire at age 60, what are my finances going to look like? Am I going to be short, whatever? Oh, mm, looks bad. Maybe if I retire at 63, how will it look? Or if I add more money, or if I do this or that, and we can do, you know, different scenarios. Uh, it answers the question, you know, can I retire early, late? Well, you know, well, if I increase my savings, you know, what will happen? You can put the data in, and it'll turn out these lovely little tables and stuff. Should I put my money into my RSP, my TFSA, or pay down my mortgage? You know, these are the decisions you want to make along the way. You know. Um, should I take my CPP early? Anybody here from uh, public service? Just one. Okay, we're not going to go into that. It tells you, you know, again, with the pension plan, taking it early, and bridge benefits. The other thing here, which is on the back of that little orange sheet here, which you can take away with you, CPP has changed. I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, it used to be that if you took it early, you lost half a percent per month, 6% a year, right? You decreased your, your entitlement. Now that's increased. So as of January 11th, you know, and it's been phased in, by 2016, anybody taking it early will be docked 7.2% for every year that they take it early. So if you take it five years early, it's over 35% of that amount is going to be decreased for the rest of your life. So that, that is a factor. And of course, on the other end, it'll go up by a certain amount also. So on those little tables there, it tells you. So when you're making that decision, what if I do take it early? How much am I going to be docked? So we're in 2013, 6.48% a year. So 6.5% a year you're going to lose. Uh, clawback. Everybody understand about OAS? No. We haven't got time to do it. So OAS clawback. So you need to understand. So the RIA is independent of your financial products. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, then, you know, just come over to the, uh, the sessions that we'll be giving at the church. And uh, the cost is their donation to the First United Church, whatever you feel. They're, they're hosting it, and it's a fundraiser for them, so whatever you like. And what I like to point out is this program is not a, it's an education program, not an infomercial. I do not sell products here. It's, it's designed to help you understand better your, the financial world. Okay. Uh, sorry it went over. <laughs> we got it very much. Yeah. Did it did it help? Did it, yeah, yeah. it start to help? Even though it was fast, and that was what I tried to. There was so much I wanted to say. <laughs> you know, I gotta get in there. Uh, but you know, if we've got four more sessions.
at the church. There'll be two hours each, and I think we'll have a little bit more time to dialogue and, and answer more questions. But if you have questions now, I'll go uh, up here and write if you need. Yeah. So, are there any particular questions that <laughs> that have come up uh, apart from the ones that we have? If you uh, if you get into a segregated fund, can you can you get it um, insured? Well, the segregated fund is insured. Now, has, it, has anybody ever heard about segregated funds? By how much? Okay, I'm just going to explain what a segregated fund. A seg segregated fund, or what they call SEG fund, S-E-G, is a mutual fund, basically the same. They buy stocks, bonds, and they make a mutual fund, but it's uh, put together by a, an insurance company, and then as a result, they can put a little extra little uh, thing on it called insurance. So what they do is they say, okay, there's your mutual fund, and we're going to guarantee it. So if you buy $10,000 worth of this fund today, 10 years from now, that fund, if it's worth less than what you bought it, this little guarantee will guarantee that you get that amount, 100%. Okay, that was the old guarantees. Now, most of these SEG funds are guaranteed for 75%. So it has to be less than, yeah, be careful. It used to be 100% guarantee. Now it's about 75. So, and the other part of the guarantee is that should you die between now and the maturity date, that 10-year uh, horizon, and your benefactor receives the, the investment, right, and it's worth less than when you bought it, then the, benefit, the beneficiary will get the amount that you paid for it. So if you bought it for 10000 and now it's worth eight, <laughs> they'll get 100%. And, and so that's the guarantee. But let's say you're at year seven of your SEG fund, and you say, well, I want to take it out, and the markets are low, right? Are you, is your guarantee good? No. 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 It doesn't guarantee it. The guarantee goes from that day that you bought it 10 years hence. On that, 10, that day 10 years from now, if you cash it in, and it happens to be less than now it's at, like I said, most of them are at 75%, those guarantees. And do you think they give you that for free? Mm -hmm. This is why. I, there are no bad products in this country or in this industry. There are only maybe inappropriate ones. Okay? You don't need that guarantee necessarily because you're paying for it. You're paying for the doodad. But it does help in some instances. So what you, when you, we talked about the MERB, so the, the mutual fund made 8%, right? And the cost of running that fund is 2%. Well, the cost of the insurance on that fund is what you're going to be using. <coughs> so your, your MER may now be 2 and a quarter percent. So your return is going to be a quarter percent less every year. OK. Now you say, well, when would, when would you want a, 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 a set fund? You know, you're paying for this thing. Some of the, the the costs are quite high, and I've got a slide that I can show that you're, you know, that how much you're paying for this insurance. Where it's handy is if you own a small business. These, uh, these funds are insured in the sense that because they're an insurance product, <coughs> when it goes to your beneficiary, it can be their creditor proof. So if you had a mutual fund and you died and you had all kinds of debt, the debtors can come in and say, you know, this is ours, and then what's left over, your beneficiaries get, right? But if you have a SEG fund and you die, they're not paying out the SEG fund, they're paying out the insurance policy. So it's an insurance policy. So if you have a small business and, and, and you have debts, potential debts that you have, it may be worth it to go with the SEG fund. Okay, or if you're looking at estate planning and stuff like that. So there are advantages to those things, but you know, understand what you're getting from the good question. Yeah. Just a general question about insurance. Is this insurance that I'm purchasing or is this insurance that the company has to buy for themselves? That's no, on the SEG fund, it's, it's built into the product. Okay. Okay, and that's why I said each product. Now, they used to have, when you bought the SEG fund, it would say, okay, and, and when you're buying anything with, with a, an insurance company, they call it a contract. You're buying a contract, insurance contract or whatever. So you buy the SEG fund and it's built in and it'll say, okay, it's guaranteed for this and da da da. And, and there are lots of other refinements on it. Some of them you can reset and all that kind of stuff. But but I'm finding now that a lot of them now, because of, you know, it's getting tougher times and it's harder to pay out these, these guarantees. 
But, you know, I, I'm saying understand what you're paying for, and if you want to pay for that, that's fine. But know what you're paying for. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe you can just uh, clarify this for me. Um, but my understanding is that uh, in a segregated fund, if you have um, insurance up to 100% on a segregated fund, you don't pay for insurance. No, well, it's built into the MER, like I said. You're not paying, you know, you are paying for that insurance. The, insur the, the, the mutual fund is insured that the uh, value you will get not less than the value when you, 10 years hence, or if you die, then your beneficiary will get less than what you paid for, right? That's what you're insured for. That's what you're buying that with a safe fund. It's not a life insurance. But you said not less than 75. Well, now what I'm saying, that used to be 100% guarantee uh, for both the maturity and the, the death benefit. Now, a lot of them are 75% at maturity and 100% at, at, the, at the beneficiary. And even that, just double check it before you buy it. Because they're all different ones. Some of them are 100 to 100, some are 70, 75, 75, and it keeps changing. So again, when you're buying a seg fund, understand that's what you're buying. And you're paying a higher MER. A management expense ratio. So you're, if the if the expense ratio is higher than the amount that you get, it's less. So you're just protecting your capital. Yes, and met, but within very confined limits. And that's what I'm saying. You're you're protecting the amount of the the principal that you that you pay the capital, but only on that anniversary date, and the day you die in between. If it happens to be in between then, and then so it reaches the anniversary date, and then it resets for another ten years. Some of them will say, okay, after five years, you can, and if the markets are doing well, you know, and it, your money's gone up, you can reset it, and then it'll be 10 years from that date. Mm -hmm. You know, so some have that. Like I said, there are all kinds of uh, uh, different things that need, you know, in the contract. I find insurance stuff so convoluted. It's not easy. And the mutual funds is simple compared to what the, 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 the variety of stuff that the insurance companies come out with and then the ifs, ands, or buts, and this and that. You know, But it's fascinating, but it's, it's, it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Um, OK, so I actually have a few questions, but I'll just ask, I don't want to swap ball with that one, so I'll just ask one now. Um, so in the case of, say, like a market collapse or like banking collapse, are there certain things, assets, like houses or something, that are better, like investments? Like, if you were to try to decide, uh, I know this focus mostly on like kind of like yeah. specific inve investing, but I'm just thinking yeah. in terms of more generally different Personally, places. Personally, you, you know, if you're, you know, again, if you're coming to an, uh, an assessment from me, I, I believe that it's a diversification whether you, you should have real estate and investments. Some people have only real estate and think, okay, that's my retirement fund and I can sell my house when I, when I, and, and in, in the past, real estate values have gone up and if you happen to have bought into Westboro 20 years or 30 years ago, you were laughing. <laughs> one, 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 one guy told me in the park, he said, God, it's like winning a lottery. He said, I bought a little house here and now it's worth I don't know how much, you know, so he's laughing. But, the general norm, not. So ask my son who is the real estate appraiser, you know. It's but it is, you know, one of the things that real estate does for you is it's what they call forced uh, savings. Because the return on, on real estate over a long period of time, statistically over time, has not been all that exceptional. Like there have been periods, but then they go down and up and everything else. So I think the numbers that I saw was like one or two percent over inflation. But you know, it's it's something tangible that people can really, really uh, relate to, and it's forced. It's a lot easier to put your pay down your mortgage, right, than it is to put your money aside in this nebulous world of, of investment, and, and you feel like you're being taken. So, you know, that's why I want this understood that you know it gets a little more concrete, and understanding you know how much do I need, and how much will I need to supplement. So, if you have a pension plan. But if you don't have a pension plan at work, then you're going to need to do a lot more, you know, to save for your retirement, so that you'll be able to retire comfortably. Uh, but real estate, definitely, I think is a good a good investment for everybody. Uh, and, and, but hopefully, you don't you don't buy something so grand that you have no money left over to live or to invest. So it's, it's to keep that balance. It sounds a little bit like 
I'm just to rephrase a little and see if I'm understanding. Because a little bit like what you're saying is uh, assuming that like the the economy kind of still exists and we still have financial assistance, even if it takes a dip, the investments overall is usually a long is a higher like return if than you, real estate. It sort of. can be, I cannot say for guarantee, but historically, and again, if you're investing well, I, I know some people that have come to me and they said, I've been in, since 2000, I haven't made a cent. You know, that's 13 years, and I'm like, huh? You know, so yeah, it can go that way. You have, that's why I said it's so important to know what you're doing, you know, because that's, so it can. And the same thing would go with the real estate market. You go and you buy, you know, an overpriced building. And, and then, you know, because you don't understand it well enough. Uh, or, as my son just pointed out to me the other day, he said he had to do an assessment. People put upgrades on this house that they were building, right? Mm -hmm. But none of these upgrades have, uh, contributed to the, the, uh, the overall value or appreciation. They were nice aesthetic things, but they don't appreciate. So, again, understanding what you're buying and knowing, you know, what you're doing a little bit. But real estate on a whole is... is is concrete and, and, and again done rationally and the other thing too is be careful when you go to the banks if they say that's why again this this uh, RI re retirement income assessment we can also do an assessment of like how much can I afford because when you go to the bank keep in mind you know they want to lend you money because if you they let the more they lend you the more they make so they may assess your capabilities much higher than what you would if you knew what you were doing so again, understand, and, we, and I have a little thing in my little booklet, is how do, I, how do I assess how much money I can really put down or afford for a house? And, and you go into the bank with that, so when they say, you know, oh, you can, you can afford 350, 400,000, no problem, you know? And then you look at your numbers and you say, but I feel comfortable with 300, you know? And, and know that that's the number that you can live within, and then still put some money aside or whatever, so yeah. So if you're about five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So and we got we got time to, to do our little gap. We, then we're gonna have uh, well it's yeah. quarter after eight. We're we're gonna, gonna, okay. Just so see if there's any more burning questions. Any more burning questions? Because <laughs> we're gonna talk and see. I, I, I'm really interested now to find out, you know, like did this help? Uh, what areas could I improve on? I know it was fast. You know, I know that, you know, but uh, you know, anyway, I, I'd like to get some feedback from you guys. And uh, one area, one uh, approach. And for everything you explain, it would be sometimes more than others that you went through. If you, you know, put it in the context of a fixed amount of money, like you're talking about, ten thousand dollars, eight percent, just always translate it into that. Because, yeah, so eight, ten thousand at eight percent. Especially when you get into the fees. All that <coughs> Very good, very good point. And, and you're talking. This is one of my clients here. She was telling me that talking about percentages. Tell me, tell me, tell me numbers that I can relate to. And I like, huh? And I, you know, this is true. So it's good. You know, I, I'm, I'm hearing it again. Yeah. Well, I just thought, because I was thinking back to our example about the, the MER and the $8. Yeah. Like, it sounds to me like what was concluded there was, okay, the 2% comes off the profit. But if you're saying 8% was the profit of the whole fund, and 2% is what they're taking, so they took $2 of the $8, that's 25% of the profit. That's not 2% of the profit. And it comes across as 2% mm -hmm. to people. And I think uh -huh. that, that bothers me, mm -hmm. kind of. Like, at least know that yeah. when you okay. see a 2% thing, it's not yeah, 20 but, cents. But again, you have to see what you're paying for. Like, I'm looking I understand what you're paying for, but I think people yeah. don't understand that. Okay. They want the numbers, so, but I, I, people, percentage, numbers, yeah. absolute numbers. I think the point is that everyone understood that we're paying for something. But I was going to say, yeah. if there were several examples, like when there was the question of, okay, so if we make, if there was no profit, then it would it would be shown as a 2% decrease, Yeah. right? Yeah. So it, you should have a couple examples of yeah. like, okay, well, if it's 8% or if it's 16% or if it's yeah. negative 8 And then put it into real And then the NMR numbers. is always 2%, then yeah. you're yeah. going to yeah. show yeah. how that works. Yeah, good point. On the plus side, the pictures were fantastic. <laughs> the transportation ideas helped. The charts, the, the, the graphs, you know, all the picture over here. Ah, okay, okay. And, uh, uh, in particular, is that the graphs? I know some people, as soon as they see graphs, 
they, they <coughs> close out with this, you know. I so know. then you also have charts. Yeah, so then I just put it in dollar value. So, so I, I like that idea here where, you know, when I'm talking percentages, convert that to actual numbers. Like yeah. a thousand dollars at eight percent would be a thousand and eight hundred. Eight. 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 yeah. And then, you know, my, my So that, that would be very helpful in the future to help people. And that, I mean, our, that's my biggest bug thing to understand, you know, get across to people, uh, you know, how, the, how people are paid in this industry. Because what's coming down the pike is this. As of, I think, probably starting in 2014 or the end of this year, all the dealers will have to put on their statements how much they were paid out of oh. the thing that you were there. But mm -hmm. guess what? Do the banks have to adhere to this? Yeah. No. Do they sell mutual funds? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do they go under another okay. heading? I, you know, oh, they say, well, they have a different way of doing things, so it's kind of hard for them to do this. Well, I didn't quite get that. You said mm -hmm. mutual fund dealers and banks both sell their own products, yeah. and I didn't know what's the difference. Okay, well, you know, Invest again. Industry is a it's an industry, you know, it's like automobiles. So if if Loblaws wants to start making automobiles, they can, all right? So the banks, after the mutual fund companies, these are basically brokers, I guess, that got together and brought some money together and created mutual funds. And they said, oh, this really works. And then we can sell little bits and pieces and everything else. Okay. Then the banks said, oh, this is good because, you know, so they built their own. Everybody can make, anybody who, who understands stocks and bonds and the, the stock market, they can make their own, and, but they have to manage them and everything else. So, so that every, all the banks create their own. And now, like I said, the insurance companies, they also have their own, but they call them seg funds. <coughs> so you know, it's the, basically, they're acting as a middleman for you. And it allows you into that market as opposed to the guaranteed market. That's it. Let's get Michael's question, Mike's mm -hmm. question, and then we'll just um, do Because we really have to get out of here by 8.30 because they told me that they come in here to do the cash and everything. Oh, oh. So, oh, so, so, yeah. Um, credit unions, good or bad? Is that too off topic? Uh, oh, that's I be really am not an expert on credit unions, but they're Come back for the fourth one. Fourth one is on credit unions. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, so my comment would be that <laughs> graph where you're showing, like, um, um, Consuming and the different thing and saying well, we normally go with the lifestyle. That I found that a very useful way to see things. Uh -huh. so Thank you. Okay, good. Because you know I, I try to lock it off and simple, and that, but it is true, eh? Yeah. That we tend to do that, and what happens is that you know we trip, and that's why I said it's it's very easy to do because investments and like I, you all pointed that out when you were tell, talking. You know, <coughs> it's, it's such a nebulous thing, and you feel like it's a black hole. You're putting your money in. And, and I agree, I agree. But I, you know, I try to get my when somebody comes to see me, I, I do the graph because <laughs> show me the money. <laughs> oh, here it is in dollars. Here it is in percentages. You know. But if I had a thousand dollars, what would it be worth today? <laughs> but Wealthy Barber talks about paying yourself first. Mm -hmm. So that's the cycle going this yes. way. Mm -hmm. yes. But it's so much more fun. You don't need some gratification of yeah. that. Well, and that's why, but if you do a re retirement income assessment, so what that does, it will then tell you, okay, if I continue on in this path, doing what I'm doing, putting this much aside, my pension, whatever, I'll have this much money when I retire. That's a wake up call. Okay, it's yeah. concrete. That's why I wanted to do these things more. I have a little uh, formula, but it's not as as, as sophisticated as this, so it doesn't take in as many variables. This goes into that, but it says, okay, if I add $50 a month or $100 a month and increase it by that much, I'm going to do this. Oh, wow, look what it can happen. But that's because it's numbers we have. Yes. Okay, Not but, then, but then you have that goal and you have it in your mind. So the next time when you go shopping and that instant gratification for that new pair of shoes or that sweater or whatever, yeah. you say, oh, if I buy this, then you know, my retirement fund, yeah. which means, it, you know, well, but if you if you keep your head in the sand about that retirement, because it's too complicated, <coughs> then what happens is you go and buy those shoes. We should put a little sticker on our credit card and our debit card. <laughs> <laughs> no? Sure. We're just watching so, you. We have to we have to <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so a couple of things. The, the, there's two follow-ups. Slow West is having three more sessions. The next one is about um, investment products that are that are ethical and or green. 
in brief and or ethical. So it's, it's like two different things. Um, product, the kind of products that Rita's talking about. Then the one after that will be about local investing. For example, investing in a solar co-op, um, which is very interesting what's happening. Um, so, and then the final one is about banking, understanding banking, understanding the process of money. What does that save money do? Where does it go? How does your bank use it? And is it better to, why would it be better to be in a credit union than a bank or vice versa, depending on what your needs are? So that's what is coming up here. Every two weeks on Thursday night, the next two are. So same time, same station, two weeks from now, except the last one is on a Sunday. So if you have a friend that can't come on Thursdays, it's sun, it'll Sunday afternoon, May 5th at 2 o'clock. There's actually extra posters up there. Uh, if you want to take one, if you promise to read it yourself, calendar it, and stick it up, Catherine's holding the note. Stick it up somewhere in a coffee shop or wherever you live. That would help us a lot. Just to get also the slow us website where uh, Adam will have your talks up available. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. And then Rita <coughs> is very graciously is going to go into much more depth in, in four sessions at First United. Uh, she's doing that as a service for our church, but also for anybody, you know, some of her clients and so on, just to get more money savvy. And it's by donation. So she, you're getting money coaching by donation, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then you had something else in the back of the brochure. Oh, it just has a, a thing. If you want to talk to me uh, in one-on-one, -on -one, uh, fill it out. And, and, and on the back of it, it's got my bio stuff, too. You know, so if you want to take one of those. And again, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, no cost and no pressure. I'm not a high-pressure person. But again, if you want to talk about this or if you want to talk about your portfolio. What I do, uh, if I look at somebody's portfolio, I'll throw the, 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 the data into the Paltrack stuff. And it's, and it, because I find most people have no idea, none at all, as to whether their money is working or not. So I throw it in and I show them the historical data on it. Like checking you what you already been yeah, invested in. Yeah. And, and, and then maybe we talk about, oops. Oh boy! No, I, 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 I thought, oh my goodness, they're turning the lights on. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, I can do that as well if you're interested. And again, no, no obligation there. So if you want one of those, they're at the back. Anything from Slow West that we should just say is going on? Uh, just uh, the main thing coming up is the launch of Bright Bike second season. Uh, so that's the bicycle sharing project uh, along this neighborhood. And uh, this year, a couple extra things will be coming in. So we'll be putting out information over the next month. But um, what they're offering, if you want to buy a, a season's pass for that, is in, there's more offered. But a lot of people who have their own bike kind of like, like to support it, but not going to use the bikes. So what do I do here? They're putting together a, a supportive membership where you can use their workshop to tune up your own bike. They have the tools. They have the advisors. You can get some free passes. So what, when your aunt comes from another city and you want to take your bike and her on a bike, you can get a bike for her and there's events and there's discounts. So they put together a package for people in these neighborhoods who have their own bike, who wouldn't really use a bike share in that way, but could use some of these other things. So we'll be putting out a whole bunch of information and on May 4th, there'll be a big launch down in McCormick Park and we'll have music and barbecue and all that kind of stuff. Is that going to be on your website? Yeah. yeah I, I, website. I looked at the videos. They've got wonderful videos on the website about, you know, when the launch of that yeah. last year. Well, well, that's, that's you'll next. be on the website. Read it. Oh, so yeah, this will be on the website sometime. Yeah. It does take a while. <laughs> All together for tonight. She is oh, really? uh, well, she'll I'll get used to it. Oh, that's my last party thing. The great and Joyce. Says, <laughs> if I'm nice, they'll reward me. This was, again, my, my primary audience is passive women. Yeah, that's an old Tell yourself <laughs> yeah. it's up to me. So, again, ladies, don't, don't, you know, delegate this Stop being party. nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and assume that it's all going to work out. We have, we have to take responsibility. <laughs> And our appreciation to Mech for the room. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and then of course here, this is, these are all these flavors and all that. Sorry. Thank you very much.